Happy Tax Day. No, that's... I do realize that I am the last talk between free beer, so I will try to take as long as possible. <laughs> uh, so I'm here to talk about the communities of data, sciences, uh, data science, and I kind of titled it an Apache Con Outsider's Viewpoint. And I'll tell you a little bit about why and how I got there, but um, this slide's mostly for the internet because they like to know who's talking. But find me on Twitter. <laughs> Like Rich mentioned, my background's in high performance computing, um, doing things in the finance industry, web data, uh, lots of kind of different places, wherever, wherever data goes, if you will. Um, to give you kind of some perspective on where I come from and the things I've done, um, I used to solve problems like this, where you take math equations and turn it into a very simple 1D model, and then compute on very large, scaled out, sc scaled up systems. Somebody asked if, if uh, how many people had 100 node clusters? Well, I actually had 100,000 node clusters. So, it did. But I don't expect everybody to get to work with those things. But the, the ultimate goal was to do something like predict Hurricane Sandy. Um, and we actually predict, highly predicted like where surge water and things like that went. Well, that was my academic life. Um, and upon the data science revolution and new startups and things like that, I've actually moved over to something a little bit more like this where taking in, uh, so taking in unstructured text off the web and lots of free open data. Um, and I actually Googled Hadoop supercomputer and I got this guy. So you can scale the heck out of it, but not so much scaled up sometimes. Um, and we're working on uh, machine learning classifiers and actual like machine learning algorithms that while on their face of it look very different from the fluid dynamics, they're actually a lot of the same math. A lot of the same underlying linear algebra used in that first domain is used in machine learning. And our application actually is I work with, uh, the, one of the major applications I work with is to helping find human trafficking victims and, and helping the defense agency help with the human trafficking crisis that's going on in the, throughout the world. But why am I here? Um, I'm here because, as you notice, the two kind of viewpoints of the worlds I worked in were very different. And I got, met this man, Chris Matman, and I had to go find a picture with his chest hair just so everybody can make sure they recognize who he is. So I'm from Texas. He's from Southern California. I work on, worked on supercomputers and simulation. He worked in, in, in the scientific community with HPC. He works on big computers with Apache and search engine technology. Let's just say we had a lot to argue about. <laughs> um, and so at the end of the day, we kind of like, well, what is, like, what is the thing that brings us as communities together? Because as data science is becoming a huge kind of uh, multiplier in businesses and everyday life, these communities are clashing in major ways. And, and there's things we can learn from each other. Um, Ultimately, I, I really like Drew Conway and, and John w Miles White's uh, Venn diagram of what data science is. Um, it's kind of this mismatch of hacking skills, math, statistics, knowledge, and some expertise in some field. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of us work in that danger zone of like not really wanting to get down into the, the math and statistics of it, but like just shoving code out on data and saying, hey, look, we, we've got some picture to show or some visualization. But the thing kind of come away from here is that there's other communities out there that have the same sort of idea, like the computational science community from the HPC. It's the same, when I went to grad school, it was instead of substantive expertise, it was physics. And hacking skills was computer science and databases. And math, and math is everywhere. Of course, saying you do math is a little bit like saying you drink an ocean. I mean, it's just too much, right? So, but from that, I have a community called NumFocus, spelled with N-U-M with all capital focus, just to make sure nobody can get it right. Um, and we have one goal, and that's to sustain open science through open code. Um, and so there's our little logo, open code, better science. And we actually have a lot of respect for the Apache Foundation, because you guys have been doing this for a long time. Um, and our community is a little bit different from you guys, and we just did things, uh, set things up just a tiny bit different. And I'm here to talk a little bit about what we did different, why, we, like, and some of the challenges that we faced in setting up our communities and kind of, and afterwards I'm definitely interested in anybody's opinions on the things I say, because I'm gonna present a lot of challenges, not a lot of solutions. 
So what does NumFocus do? We have our projects. I'll show you our projects page. We don't have nearly as many projects as Apache. Uh, we try and keep small into the data science world. We do education and fellowships. We have a lot of women in technology events. Um, we strongly believe that if you don't include half of our population in code, you are not someone we want to work with. Um, thank you. I think, I think a big thing we do is just help people understand the money side of things. And I'll explain a little bit why that's so important for our communities. Um, and, and then we have a conference series called Pi Data, which has got like, I think, eight conferences a year now. Um, here are a few of the, the codes that we work with. Um, these are all our fiscally sponsored codes. We have a, a long list of codes that we do other things with. They primarily come from the Python ecosystem, um, but we've branched out into R and Julia and, uh, and anyone we kind of work with. We have at least two uh, of these up here, data carpentry and software carpentry, which are purely educational. Um, and so and Insight, which is a, blog, uh, a podcast system and things like that. Um, so definitely come check us out on our webpage, and we have a, a lot of codes, and we're trying to help people go, go forward. And here's kind of some of the people that made it happen. This is our board members and our executive directors um, from industry, academia, government labs, and so kind of a, a whole range of folks. So let's kind of fast forward to kind of the bulk of my talk. Uh, so I come from a community. You guys have a community. We have different ways of doing things. But as far as like, things go, we approach challenges a little bit differently. Um, and the first kind of challenge is I want to go through three challenges that we have, as a community have seen and are trying to address. Um, and I'm definitely very interested in anybody's opinion on how they address them differently and things like that. Um, so our first challenge is keeping code alive. I think Apache is probably the only foundation I've seen around code that has a really well-defined process of going from top-level projects to incubator projects and so on and so forth. Um, but for us, it's, it's not only just a matter of like telling people how to build the code, it's actually explaining to them that what happens if your code doesn't, isn't maintained. Because remember, at the first, like, only compute, the code was only one third of those circles of that Venn diagram of both communities that it come from. And so if code is kind of thought of as the side project, is like something that just gets to work, then it's not nearly respected enough to actually maintain. And I think a lot of people, you give them the analogy of a house. You go live in a house, you fix up that house, you constantly work in that house. And for people who haven't ever owned a house, I, 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 got, I have this pleasure of now owning uh, my own home for the last two years, and I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to not own my home anymore. <laughs> if, if you want anything to stop it so for you actually working on your open source project, my house does it perfectly. <laughs> so while we as coders know that bit rot is very real and that it codes that's not maintained um, will not be, able, be f as functional in 50 years as it is today. And those are like a lot of the codes we're using in data science, like the, the blahs and lin lin uh, linear algebra, LAPLAC, and things like that. They're actually on the order 50-year-old codes. Um, so don't think that like the things we're doing today are not going to exist for 50 years. In fact, the chips, the machines, the, the ways we actually wire things together, the, that stuff's all changed. But the code has stay, stuck around for like these 50 years. And so when we think about our communities, we really do need to think of that 50 to 100 year kind of like how do we go forward. And then, but today there's perhaps even more of a crisis so people aren't thinking about the code and then where do the people go? So where are the people going who built this code? And that's become probably the biggest challenge for science um, is keeping people in the field to do data science for science itself. And so traditionally there's been what I call kind of four different areas where people have gone. Those people have built those, those co last codes we've used for the 50 years from universities um, to the Department of Energy. The Department of Energy actually funds a lot of code. I think that pretty much everyone here is using code on their laptop the Department of Energy has built. Um, to things like observe, observations, like here I have a, a picture of, a, uh, I think, the Chilean telescope. And I know lots of people at telescopes and lots of people like CERN and, and Fermilab and like around instruments. Because to keep their instruments up and running, they have to have the code and maintain codes. 
Um, then there's also places like that help scientists work on their codes from like a, a perspective of like a supercomputing center. Our supercomputing centers, um, there's, I, I met some folks here from Exceed, our supercomputing centers are doing an amazing job of hiring lots of coders to help scientists still write code and keep it running on these big machines. Um, and it's not, it's, it's not a glamorous job. These, none of these places are places that you, know, you think of on CSI or, or making the big waves in Silicon Valley investor decks and things like that. And then there's this massive kind of um, army of people called postdocs who do a lot of work and get paid very little. Um, and that is also a problem if we depend upon paying people very little in order to do some of our most critical research. So, oh, that's backwards. So all of these places have their limits and they've kind of hit them. And what we're finding in science is most people are doing this. They're finding out that the Google bus is going to pay them more, give them better problems, and, and get them into uh, career paths, perhaps, that um, are more amenable to their, their way of life, of actually working on the code, maintaining the code, and understanding. So there are companies that understand code is very important. So one of the challenges is definitely keeping those people who go to those companies still engaged in the community um, and contributing back to the community and making sure that we as a, a people can still work in the science codes that we, we appreciate and we can still get back. And I think that Apache, uh, one of the reasons I'm super excited of being here is that Apache is one of the few organizations that does that so well. Um, very few kind of organizations do as good a job at getting commercial entities giving back code as Apache does. And there's lots of reasons why. But even so, in this kind of structure where people are doing different things, not everybody agrees that code is the most important thing, it's become very difficult to actually build out the kinds of projects we need. Um, the legal structure between organizations are much different, um, and academic funding is getting much tighter. I mean, it's, it's very easy for a graduate student or a postdoc to start a new project, but it's very hard for them to maintain that project past their kind of initial years of, of learning. And so this kind of flow between the scientific software writers and, and the data science writers and, that build this community and being thrown out or often going to, com to companies that don't allow them to give back to, uh, to the open source world is kind of causing a lot of constraints of what we can do um, as a society for data science on a whole. And I think that it's some problem we need to kind of address as a community and say, hey, we need to make sure that when we go back to our companies, when we go back to our institutions, that code is important enough that we have to give back and it has to be a, a big deal. Um, to give you an example, uh, my good friends at the IPython, uh, IPython project, how many people have heard of IPython? Awesome. The rest of you guys, start Googling now. Just stop listening to me, start Googling IPython. It'll change your life. IPython has, has become so interesting that like uh, and that pretty much every kind of big data science vendor out there is using IPython notebook and they're using IPython through everything they do. It links up um, many different types of codes. I think they have like 50 different languages and things like that that can run in their framework. Um, and it's, it's become such a big deal that Nature, that Nature Magazine actually has publications built on top of this, net, this notebook. And so now scientists are able to intermingle both their, their prose and their code into the same document and serve it up on the web. I mean, Don Knuth thought of this many years ago. It's actually very much alive today and the science community is moving very close to this um, kind of interactive, literate programming style. But IPython is, while it might look like just a publishing kind of uh, idea, it's, it's a very big system. And the team is actually spread out quite, quite widely. It's on two continents with four academic institutions and several companies. Uh, just getting the people together to pay for things uh, is, is very challenging. And if you go through the normal academic channels, they, the people who actually work on the project probably only see about 30% of that money. Um, nothing against our academic institutions um, or the, the legal structures we have set up today, but I just don't think that's acceptable. That like going in and, and doing the, the most important work in my mind of getting our community together and sharing code uh, gets, gets uh, chopped down so much. And so, and the, 
once you go to that level of, if you give money to the organizations that are building the future, and it gets chopped down to 30%, how are they gonna compete on keeping the salaries of the, the companies need in order to keep con contributing? And so that's effectively why Num Focus was born. So the data, we found the data science community is a very diverse set of jobs. It's not just coders, it's not just mathematicians, it's not just um, any one specific field. So we need, a, there has to be a variety of options to grow uh, and, and, and learn inside that community. Um, the open code projects have kind of like, if you want to run an open code project and have a lot of impact, um, there's, there's kind of, there are projects out there that have been very well established. If one person's come out with a big thing and it's gone really well, but once you go beyond that and to maintain that, you have to be able to handle this complexity, this, the legal structures to get money into the organization so you can, so your developers can eat. I mean, um, so that you can keep servers running and everything like that. So NumFocus, one of the challenges we kind of set out to say is, is we need to come back together and solve this idea of like who's working on the code, maintaining code, and making it a first class citizen in everything we do. So enough on that one. Challenge two. I think this one is kind of beating a dead horse, making codes usable legally. I think Apache is, is a good, uh, 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 has a good community and a good record for showing this. Um, but I'll just kind of throw it up here for folks who maybe not uh, and tell my story around uh, making the legality and then code licensing and things like that. So I started off in, um, in academia and the viewpoint in very early on was, well, you make your code GPL because you don't want somebody making money out of it without you getting gaining from that. Which at the face of it is like, yeah, let's, we're gonna keep a community that's away from that aspect and everybody has to give back to us. Um, but very quickly you learned, well wait, well wait a minute, like the government pays me to do innovation into my code and then I'm telling the, everybody else that they have to play by my rules in order to use my code. It became kind of a strain, kind of uh, personally for that. And um, we also, I also found that like more or less people just didn't have, uh, like you would just have get less users on the, on, in my particular field. Uh, because of that GPL. And so often, so I have a lot of code out there that's GPL, that's very bought into it and, and believe in it wholeheartedly. But at the end of the day, like, I feel like if science is coming, science wants to succeed, it needs to be free for everyone. And that means every, any, even companies that want to innovate and go further. Um, I try to use the Apache license, but Apache's license wasn't as accepted at universities at the time. Um, I think patent indemnification, universities still don't quite understand that you know, software patents are not necessarily the, the best idea. Um, and they, they don't understand that software patent indemnification. So like the only option I really had was use an MIT or BSD style license. Uh, which is, this is okay. I mean, like, and that's largely what our community is kind of focused on. Um, now we get into arguments about, can you do two or three clause, and then you get to see the legal department try to count, and oh, that is brilliant. Um, so MIT or BSD happens quite a bit in, inside, at least the, um, the scientific Python community, because of all these tensions that come along. Now I come back and I look at it from a corporate side, now being part of a startup, and I see, hey, look at how much more interest there is from the uh, commercial segment because of that patent indemnification clause in, a, in ALV2. And I told Chris before I came out here, he had to turn off his ALV2 bot. I don't know if you guys have ever gotten this, but now he tags all my code as ALV2. <laughs> I, I love the guy, but you know, there, there's limits. <laughs> Uh, so, so more or less, like I think everybody has a story somewhere along the lines of like figuring out what this l license stuff is going on. And one thing that you know foundations and communities can do is kind of help target around what what licenses to use. Like I talked to a lot of people in the R community, and you ask, well, why are you using GPL? And their their answer is like, well, that's what they my community used, and there's no reason to switch. And, but that's kind of not true anymore because that's why Python is often take, is, is said to be taking off as a data science language because there's a lot of people who are much more willing to use that and release code that way. Um, so code licensing was actually the easy problem. Data is the hard problem. And I don't know of a good solution. I know what people do. I know the patterns. 
Some people will, you know, give you NDAs to sign. Some people will um, pass big laws like HIPAA. And I mean, HIPAA is actually just a set of laws to scare you into not doing anything. I mean, like, that's my view of it. Uh, I love lawyers. I, I do. <laughs> Um, and then there's people who like air gap systems. I, I, being in the commercial world now, I've learned what air gap systems are. And they like, so the sort of thing like, yeah, I've worked on some of the largest supercomputers in the world. I don't consider that like what I want to spend my life doing. But it's all out of this problem of sharing your data. And we have actionable insight in your data or we have personal data, in, personal attributes and data. How do you kind of work on that? Um, and the final kind of challenge is keeping code interoperable. Um, I think that this one is one that a lot of people don't kind of realize until they start getting into the big data world. Because once you start using some of the traditional means of just calling out from the JVM to serializing to a C uh, code and back or through a RESTful API, you're actually leaving a lot of things on the table. And so while it's been the case that RESTful APIs and serialization and things like that techniques work really well for uh, small data codes, they don't work so well once you get to too big a size. Um, in fact, I love this paper um, by Kathleen Fisher and company on the next 700 descript data description languages. And I was like, really, we need 700 more? <laughs> um, but it's, it's a, the data has become the big operating system of today. This is how we exchange almost everything we do through some simple RESTful API or through files exchange and things like that. And so being able to talk about data in a very smart way has become a, a huge topic in academia, but also fuels a lot of fights between proto, proto buffs versus thrift versus Avro and all that sort of thing as well. But there's also kind of something else going on as well. And I think we see in this conference a lot of containers coming along. And there's this kind of viewpoint of like containers versus install. Uh, so my company produces an open source product called Anaconda, which just helps people install stuff um, and makes it very easy for you to install stuff. And then we also use Docker a lot because installing other people's software is the most pain you will ever face in your life. <laughs> well, now it's not so bad because we have Docker. But this whole idea of a container versus an installer, if you're working with a supercomputing community where they don't want any other process going on during their, 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 pro during their uh, uh, jobs, I mean, I've literally had people tell me, I didn't get every single megabyte of memory I had in my terabyte memory system. And, and th these people do exist. So there is this kind of contention of how do you solve that sort of problem. Um, to this end, in one, in, in one of the DARPA contracts we had, we have, uh, I think we have 17 groups of, quote, big data solutions, uh, including things like Spark um, and Aripe, which is an R on a Hadoop thing and things like that. And the, the, the big question came, how do you actually make these codes work together when they have completely separate stacks? And you listen to uh, Jan Stoika talk about the Berkeley data stack, and it's like one stack to solve all the problems. And that's a very CS viewpoint of how to solve a problem. I'm just going to build a new system. You're going to get on my boat, and you're going to be able to do everything for me, and it's going to work, right? Uh, so we built a little code that was going to call out to uh, the, the common crawl and do a lot of uh, graph analytics um, with these, I think, at the end of the day, it, was like, it ended up being seven different languages. Um, but this is the, the X cross language uh, solution we came up with. When we step back and we ask, what did we actually do? We actually built a database that was exposed. You, you have effectively got records from this controller. You avoided the JVM as much as possible. Love you, Java guys, but please stop moving my memory. Uh, but so you actually, and we had people who own, like in an ownership model for where the data came from and, and so on and so forth. Turns out it's a little bit of a nightmare to use. Okay, but it was the only way we knew how to actually get all these programs together. So once again, it came back to let's stop thinking about um, exact semantics of data and go back and think about where is my memory? What, how do I describe that memory? How do I pass a description over and actually get these codes working together? I think that more and more the communities inside data science are, there's more codes coming out in more languages, and getting those things interoperable is a very important, very critical piece of going forward and, and being able to use each other's work. 
So that's my three kind of basic um, challenges that I see. I, I could go on and on, but um, Chris, Chris told me not to tell you how fast MPI is and how, how much I love uh, Python and that sort of thing, so I, I'll stop here. Um, <laughs> But I think a few observations, especially for people who are just coming into the field or who want to be inside the data science world, um, is like keeping your keeping code and process open to new forms of collaboration and contribution is very important. Um, data science is a very hard discipline. There's a lot of open problems. A lot, a lot of the low-hanging fruit has been picked off, but there's still grand challenges out there. As we see the Internet of Things come on, and we see. Um, and just people using data to make all their business decisions. I think that there is a, it's, it's a very ripe field to get into and learn about, but it's also um, one of the hardest places to actually work together and, and make sure that you're still working and keeping pace. Um, the, a big thing over and over again is keep your, keep your code as usable for all users. It's not enough just to have your code, an open source code on GitHub. That is not an open community. That is just a, a dump. I mean, it's just like I can go and buy a refrigerator at a dump, or I can buy a refrigerator at Sears and Roebuck. Um, okay, Sears. I'm not that old. <laughs> it was Sears when I was born, I swear. Uh, <laughs> but um, it, it, it does matter where you come together and put pieces together. And having a community and making it so more people can open that community, and that means not only um, putting your code and putting your commits and your JIRA tickets, also inviting people and showing them how to fix it and saying thank you for solving this issue or, or being a, a good player and a mentor. And this, and finally, it's, a, it's kind of the dead horse I beat, is interoperability is, is, is really crucial. I think that um, as we go forward, any system that doesn't keep up with interoperability is just limiting the uh, number of users it can come, uh, it can use, can interact with. I think the looking at how Spark has evolved, where it was a very Scala, Java-based thing, and then it comes to Python, and then R, and then SQL, you can see that evolution of like the uptick and how it evolved. And I think that's a very important lesson for everyone to learn. So with three minutes to spare, I will say thank you very much and take any questions. Um, there, if you want to contact me, Twitter is the best way. I do get emails, but I also get a lot of emails. So thank you very much for your attention.